pretty intense, so our voice is a little weak. Well, let's sing with all of our heart. 235. <laughs> Turn to page 167. 167. Did you sing this in this week? No. Okay. We're going to <laughs> Oh, the hand has 
may be seated. Aren't you glad for the joy that Jesus gives us? What a blessing it is to be back in the house of God tonight. Thank you so much uh, for being with us tonight. Uh, let me tell you up front, I mentioned it I think this morning. We've got a, let me turn my mic on here. There we go. We've got a funeral uh, that we need to go to. So um, uh, Spring's got to sing. So as soon as we get through with the service part tonight, we'll be slipping off with the mic. We'll be handling the uh, prayer time. Uh, so you just be much uh, in prayer. Got, uh, I listed several uh, prayer requests that have just happened in the last little bit. Uh, and uh, he'll be sharing those with you uh, during our prayer time tonight. Uh, but it is good to see you. Appreciate you being with us in the house of God. As far as our announcements go, uh, well, I'll tell you what, before we do that, let's open up with a word of prayer. All right, Father, we do come to you thanking you so much for the opportunity and the privilege we have to be in your house. What a blessing it ought to be for us as believers to gather with one another. But, Father, not only in the gathering, but, Father, also in the lifting up worship to you. Father, I pray that you just have your way in, in uh, everything that's done here tonight. Father, whether it's in the classes downstairs, over in the, uh, uh, with the youth. Father, I think even they're going to be doing some kind of a puppet show uh, for the Rama children tonight. So, Father, I pray you'd bless them and their efforts and their willingness to do that. Father, I pray that it'd be just a blessing and an encouragement. Uh, and then, Father, I pray that you'd be with us in our service as well, that we'd see you just touch and move, and we'll give you the praise for all that you do. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, as far as our announcements go, uh, the Pastor Deacon Fellowship uh, is tomorrow at 6.30 at, the, at downtown at the Bank of Tennessee. Uh, so remember that change of location. The youth group, uh, the, uh, the RADA or RADA knife orders and, and money are due this coming Wednesday night, March the 1st. If you need a catalog or have any questions, please see Sister Christy Moore. That's in relation to the fundraiser for our youth. Uh, the fellowship dinner this Wednesday, again, March the 1st. Uh, manwich, coleslaw, potato salad, drinks, and cookies. Uh, then uh, the coat and blanket drive, as we heard this morning. We don't need coats any longer. Blankets are still needed. And snacks, things that are you know pre-wrapped, that don't need to be refrigerated, those kind of things, little Debbie cakes, crackers, you know, cheese crackers, peanut butter crackers, uh, anything along those kind of lines would be great, very definitely and greatly appreciated. Uh, and then Operation Christmas Child, small books, games, and puzzles. Uh, other things that are coming up later in the month and even a little bit later, one of them really later in the year, but still need to do it now. Uh, the New Veterans Outreach, Valor, is first meeting is March the 9th at 6 o'clock in the banquet hall. Please sign up for that, uh, just uh, at least for this first meeting so we kind of get an idea of how many folks to expect. Uh, then also save the date for the rummage sale, March 31st and April the 1st. Uh, sale items can be dropped off March 15th through the 29th. Then the ladies' retreat is September 22nd through September uh, 24th. But the deposit, the $25 deposit, uh, can be paid now to either Sister Robin or to Sister Kathy. All right. Uh, any other announcements uh, that I'm forgetting there? All right. Then let's get into the Word of God tonight. Turn with me again back to 1 Timothy chapter number 3. 1 Timothy chapter number 3. Didn't plan this this way. This is just how God had been burdening my heart. As you know, we finished up, excuse me, we just finished up the series that we've been doing on worship. And for the next few weeks, uh, God's just kind of burdened my heart uh, to just kind of move away from series preaching for just a few weeks and, and, uh, and, and just delve into some specific things here in the Word of God. That's what we'll be doing tonight. Uh, and over the next few weeks, also plan as part of that to uh, use the men of God that we have here in the church uh, on some of these Sunday nights. To uh, uh, I think it's good for you to hear other people besides me uh, all the time. So Brother Mike and, and, and Brother Dave and, and Brandon, and, and so you know, you'll be hearing from them over the next, here in the next little bit as well. Uh, but tonight, and then after that, let me, I will share this much with you. When we finish up um, the, uh, the short series that we're doing on the deacons and the importance and the qualifications, all that for the deacons, when we finish that up, we're going to move into a series called Living by Faith. Uh, God had really burdened my heart. I had initially thought, had prayed about doing that on Sunday nights after we you know, finished the worship series. And actually, if you go back and you look at when we shared the blessing service, I actually said that. 
but while we were up at the mountain uh, and I was praying and had some time just to kind of, you know, concentrate and get away from some things, God really began to burden my heart about moving that series to Sunday morning. So here in a couple of weeks, we'll be starting that series, Living by Faith, Victorious and Haphazard Faith and the Difference that It Makes is the series, and so we'll be doing that. So here in a few weeks on Sunday nights, when we kind of take this break from series uh, for just a few weeks, uh, we're going to pick up in our first Peter series that we've been doing on Sunday morning, we're going to move that to Sunday night. Uh, so we'll be doing that here coming up in the next, it'll be a few weeks. Like I said, uh, God's burdened my heart about two or three particular messages that we're going to be working, that we'll be doing. And then like I said, I'm hoping to be able to engage some of these other men of God to help us uh, on Sunday nights uh, and just let them share what God's burdened their heart with as well. Uh, but tonight we're in 1 Timothy chapter number 3 once again, just a few verses down from where we stopped uh, this morning, 1 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse number 16, 1 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse number 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Father, I ask now that you just Hide me behind Calvary as I try to share just these simple thoughts that you've burdened my heart with tonight. May it encourage us and, and Father, lift our hearts as we see just some of these wonderful things uh, throughout your word about what Christ revealed about God, about you. And Father, I pray that you would just touch and hide me, like I said, behind Calvary. Use me to share these things in a way that, Father, we couldn't do anything but just praise you for all that you've done for us. We lift you up and we ask it in Jesus' name, and amen, and amen. Now, you have to understand that when you look at 1 Timothy and the book of Titus, that these books are often called the pastoral epistles, and the reason they're called that is because they're written to what is believed to be, although there is some discussion, but it's believed to be written to two young pastors, one Timothy, obviously, the other Titus. Uh, and in these two chapters, or in these two books, excuse me, in these two books, you see doctrine, but you also see very practical, uh, this is how the church needs to function kind of things. And this is one of those doctrinal passages uh, that we see here. We looked this morning at how the church is to function. We talked about specifically the deacons. We uh, looked a little bit uh, in connection with that to the role of pastor. But here we've jumped into pure doctrine. Uh, once again, and, and, and this is, to me, is probably one of the most underrated statements in all of Scripture. If there was a verse of Scripture that you read and you basically said, this is a complete understatement, this is the one uh, to me. All and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Now, when you look at these words, just in those ver in that part of the verse right there, you see a lot of different things. First off, it says without controversy, and the idea of that phrase just means nobody is going to argue the point. <laughs> That's what with. And again, I'm going to give you the East Tennessee hillbilly translation here, basically. Without controversy, nobody is going to argue the point. Then you see the word great, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Well, the word great there carries the idea of not only uh, great weight, but of also great importance. Uh, again, uh, if you wanted to kind of put it in, in, the, in how we say it today, it would basically be, man, this is major. <laughs> I mean, it really does kind of carry that uh, terminology when you think about it, because the word itself is mega. And, you know, we talk about, you know, um, mega sales, you know, beyond, you know, this is a huge impact or huge uh, uh, importance uh, of the time. Then you've got the word mystery. Now, when you look at the word mystery in the New Testament, it carries a, a, a different meaning than what we normally think of as mystery. Mystery in normal sense, in a normal sense, when we think of it, is something that, you know, you, you try to solve. 
But mystery in the New Testament is something different. It's an event or a particular doctrinal truth that was historically hidden, specifically in the Old Testament, but that was later on revealed, especially in most cases, in the New Testament, in the person and in the work of Jesus Christ. And then you've got this great phrase, the mystery of godliness. Now, the idea behind the word godliness here is kind of two, or this mystery of godliness, there's kind of two things going on. First of all, part of the mystery of godliness is that God himself would take on human flesh. All right? Why would God do that? I mean, that's the mystery. That's the hidden truth. We know if you look at the Old Testament, you see things like, the uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you see in Genesis chapter number 1, let us make man in our own image. So throughout the Old Testament, we see this idea, and even talking about the Spirit of God moving upon the waters or the seven spirits of God in the book of Isaiah and, and all of these things. We see that God is one person uh, or one being in three persons. We see it kind of throughout the Old Testament. But it was in a mystery. There was just little hints, little pops that let us know something is going on here. And it's only in the New Testament that we see this idea of the Trinity really explained, really brought out, specifically the fact that God himself became flesh and dwelt among us. So that's part of the mystery. But the second part of the mystery that we see here as well is that until Christ actually was manifested in the flesh and all of the other descriptors that we see here in this verse, man had no real idea of how they could be godly or exhibit godliness in their own, on their own. The Old Testament Jews had the law. But all the law did was say, thou shalt not, or thou shalt. It didn't give any real means for how to accomplish that. There was no empowering. It was simply information. This is what God expects. But there was nothing about that uh, that fell into that, or fell after that, that said, and this is uh, you know, how that you can accomplish that. Now, we know the reason why. Because the Bible tells us now, and again, this is part of that mystery, we know, according to Romans, that in our flesh dwells no good thing. We can't do it in the flesh. We have to have the Spirit of God living in us. And the Spirit of God is ours because of the work that Christ did. He said, I... I go and you and, and he said I will send another comforter and that comforter the Holy Spirit of God then is what empowers us and allows us to live the life that God wants us to live it is only through the empowering of the Holy Spirit that is ours because of the work of Christ on the cross that mystery of godliness that we actually can demonstrate godliness ourselves Okay, so that's the mystery of godliness. God came in the flesh, but he also gave us the means of wh by which that we can live godly lives as well. So that's the mystery of godliness. Then you have the word manifest. It simply means make known. God was made known in the flesh. Now, when we think of the magnitude of those words, it's no wonder that God would be made known in the flesh. It's no wonder that Paul would say no one's going to argue the point that this is something hard to comprehend, okay? As Christ was preparing his disciples for his crucifixion, Philip said this, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Show us the Father, and we'll be satisfied. And Jesus' answer fits right into the text that we just read because he said, Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? So what Christ is saying here is, and again, you know, some have confused this verse to teach that God's really not a trinity. He just reveals himself in three different ways through time. That's a heresy, by the way, known as modalism. 
<laughs> but it's a different thing altogether. But what it is saying here is that Christ revealed the Father to us. All right? God, Christ revealed God to us. But what did Christ make known about God? And there are a lot of different things we could talk about. But as I was praying, as I was studying, God brought me to these kind of four topics, okay? First of all, Christ revealed God's power and authority. As we think on this part of Christ's revelation of God, we see, first of all, the power and authority of His Word. The Bible says in Luke 4, 31 and 32, and came down, talking about Christ, and came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days, and they were astonished at His doctrine. Now listen, for His Word was with power. And Mark 1, 21 and 22, And they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught, and they were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. So what Christ revealed about God was both the power and the authority of, of his word it wasn't just it was not just a repetition and and if you read a lot of jewish literature and in 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 the in the targums and 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 the mishnah and all of those kind of things you'll see and rabbi so-and-so said that rabbi so-and-so said that rabbi so-and-so said that rabbi so-and-so said and you'll see that over and over and over again as you study what christ did was he he did not say rabbi so-and-so said this he said god the father said this and he revealed that it wasn't in the authority of people, but it was in the authority of God himself and the power of his word that he spoke. So the first thing he did was reveal God's power and authority in his word. But then secondly, he also revealed God's power and authority <coughs> Excuse me, in his works. Now, go with me to Mark chapter number 5. I want you to see this. We're not going to read a whole lot here, but you may want to mark this down in your Bible because it's a blessing. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. Mark chapter number 5. Mark chapter number 5. Now, if you read this passage, you'll see that Christ has power and authority over devils. Look at chapter number 5, starting in verse 1. And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of, of the, out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. And, of course, we know this is the story. If you go all the way down through verse number 20, this is the account of the devils entering the swine, the swine jumping off the cliff. Okay, that's the story. So the first thing that we see here is that Christ has power over the devils. He said, go. Right? They were scared to death that he was going to judge them right then. But instead, he says, go. So in verses 1 through 20, we see Christ and God's power and authority over devils. But then in verses 25 through 34, we see Christ's power over disease. And it actually starts back in verse 21, actually. What do we see? And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people, this is verse 21, gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the city. And behold, there came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed with him and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had and was nothing better but rather grew worse when she had heard of Jesus came in the press behind and touched his garment for she said if I may but touch him touch but his clothes I shall be whole and straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague now again we know Christ immediately knew what had happened and he asks another one of those great rhetorical questions that we've been talking about in Genesis who touched me the disciples look at him and go, what do you mean? There's a thousand people here, and you're asking who touched me. And so here we see 
not only in verses 1 through 20 we see Christ's power and authority and, and as an extension of that, God's power and authority over disease, but we are over devils. But now here in verses 25 through 24, we see his power over disease. Christ used his power and authority over disease to show that he also had power. If you go back to Mark chapter number 2, he also used that power and authority to show that not only did he have power and authority over disease, but he also had power and authority over sin because he told the man who had been dropped down through the roof, thy sins be forgiven you, and then he healed him from that disease that he had. So he's got power and authority over devils. He's got power and authority over disease. Well, then keep reading the chapter. Then you see there that he's got power and authority over death. Because by the time they get to Jairus' house, what's happened? Jairus' daughter has died. And he raises the daughter from the dead. Now, if you study, and you look at this, and this is one of those little blessing things that you find when you study Scripture. Here, we see Christ's power and authority over somebody who's freshly dead. She had just died in the last 30, 45 minutes or so. So she's freshly dead. Then you go to the widow of Nain, and he raises her son from the dead, and he's recently dead. So freshly dead, recently dead. Then you go to Lazarus, Lazarus, not Lazarus, Lazarus. You go to Lazarus, and he's been dead four days. He's decomposing. Why do we know that? Because she said, surely he stinketh. And then we see even his own death. I have power to lay my life down, and I have power to take it back. I heard a preacher say this one time, and it absolutely blessed my heart, and I've never forgot this. He said in this one chapter, in, in, in Mark chapter number 5, that's why I said you needed to mark those three things down. He said, you see here that Christ has victory over the devil. He has victory over disease, and he has victory over death. When it comes down to it, we don't have any more enemies than that. <laughs> so that's the power and authority of Christ revealing the power and authority of God the Father. But then we also see that Christ reveals God's grace and truth. Go with me to John chapter number 1 real quickly. John chapter number 1. Very familiar passage of Scripture. You probably know the verses even before I read them. And the Word, starting in verse 14, John 1, 14 through 18. And the Word was made flesh. Here we go back to that same concept back in 1 Timothy 3. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This is he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now here he goes, right back into this idea of the revelation of God through the grace and truth of Christ. Look, no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father... He hath declared. He hath revealed him. All right? As I was thinking about these verses, God showed me something that kind of shook me up here. If grace without truth had come by Jesus Christ, then God would have been revealed as unholy. Now think about this. If grace had come without truth, then God would have been revealed as unholy. Why? Why? Because his holiness demanded that sin be dealt with. And Christ came in the flesh to die so that sin would be dealt with. Truth without grace would have shown God as holy and righteous. But there would have not been any kind of an expression of his love. So Christ came in the flesh so that we could recognize the truth found in John 3.16. For God so loved the world, there's the grace, that God gave His only begotten Son, 
That's the truth. Christ came in love, and he paid the penalty for sin. And in doing that, Christ revealed both the grace and truth of God. In the incarnation of Christ, grace and truth were come together. The Bible says in Psalm 85 and verse number 10, mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Without a doubt, the grace and truth of God was revealed in the coming and the death of Jesus Christ. But then thirdly, we see that Christ revealed God's sovereignty and God's freedom. In my studying for this message, I came across this quote in one of my theology books. The attributes of God make clear that God is supreme over all. He yields to no other power, authority, or glory, and is not subject to any absolute greater than himself. He represents perfection to an infinite degree in every aspect of his being. He can never be surprised, defeated, or uncertain. Aren't you glad about that? Let me say that one more time. Listen, he can never be surprised, he can never be defeated, and he can never be uncertain. However, without sacrificing his authority or jeopardizing the final revelation of his perfect will, it has pleased God to give men a measure of freedom of choice. And for the exercise of this choice, God holds man responsible. So Christ reveals God giving us both, or revealing God's sovereignty and God's willingness to give us the freedom to choose to serve and or reject God. Isaiah 46, verses 9 through 10 says this, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. That's that sovereignty, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. That is the sovereignty of God. There's no doubt that the Bible teaches and shows that God is in complete control. But even with that, he's given mankind the ability to choose whether to serve him or not. In the Garden of Eden, that choice was manifested in the command not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that we've been talking about in Sunday school. Adam and Eve's failure at that point is what necessitated the coming of Christ in the flesh to provide a way of salvation. But even though Christ came to die and he paid the penalty for the sins of the whole world, salvation is still a matter of choice. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But we see the necessity of choice in, a, in passages like John chapter number 7, verses 37 and 38. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me. That's a choice. Let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And in John 1, 12, we read, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. When Christ came in the flesh, he came so that people would see the sovereignty of God manifested in the working of his miracles from feeding the 5,000 with scraps of bread and fish, calming the storms on the water, uh, and casting out demons and healing disease and conquering death, all of the things that we've looked at. But in John 6, we see the exercise of sovereignty and also his willingness to give us freedom walk hand in hand. In John chapter number 6, starting in verse 65. <clears throat> and he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. That's sovereignty. From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? A bunch of people's left him. That's freedom. He asks the disciples, are you going to leave too? 
That's freedom. Of course, we know Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Ultimate sovereignty and ultimate freedom were manifested by Jesus Christ to show us the person of God. But then lastly, we also see that in him, love and mercy are revealed. The reason that the events of Bethlehem even occurred was because of the necessity of the cross. As I was thinking about that, my mind went back to two things that happened at Calvary. The first were Christ's words in Luke chapter 23, verses 30, in Luke 23, verse 34. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If ever there was a manifestation of the love of God, it was in Christ's words here, as he looked upon those who mocked him, who spat upon him, who beat him, and who wanted him dead. And he says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what, they do, what, they don't know what they're doing. But I want to show you mercy as well. We all know that Christ was hung between two thieves, and often we hear these three men referred to this way. Christ died for sin. One thief died in sin, and the other thief died to sin. Why? Listen again to verses 20, Luke 23, verses 39 through 43. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. He's the one who died in sin. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. That's the one who died to sin. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. That's the one that died for sin. But let me show you the love and mercy of Christ in another passage. Listen to Matthew 27, starting in verse 34. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there, same two thieves. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand, another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will deliver him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God." Tell me again, they didn't know that Christ claimed to be the Son of God? The thieves also, same two thieves. The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. Did you catch that? The thieves both started out mocking him. But one as he watched the crowds and saw the infinite love of the Savior, realized that Christ had to be more than man. That's why he said, when thou, when, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. For only God could show that kind of compassion and love to people who would treat him that way. And even though he had mocked him, and even though he had no chance of serving him in this life, and even though he had no claim upon it, the thief cried out for mercy. I've seen your love, and I believe you'll have mercy. Have mercy on me, 
when you enter into your kingdom. And even though the thief had mocked him, and even though the... Th uh, 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 nowhere in the scripture will you find greater evidence, a greater manifestation of the love and mercy of God than in his actions and words in the moments before Christ died on the cross. Great is the mystery of godliness. God manifest in the flesh. And as he did that, he revealed God's power and authority. He revealed God's grace and truth. He revealed God's sovereignty and freedom. And he revealed God's love and mercy. Is it any wonder that Paul would say, without controversy, without any chance of arguing, God Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. My Heavenly Father, how I thank you for this little whirlwind of theology. Sometimes we just need to take a step back sometimes and realize how beyond our comprehension your plan really has been. That, Father, in the revealing, in the birth of Christ, in Him taking on human form, in Him becoming as much man as if He had never been God, while at the same time being as much God as if He had never been man, that we can see Him reveal the things about the Godhead that we stand in need of. How we thank You that You truly are in complete control. How we thank you for your grace and truth. How we thank you that you give us the freedom to choose. And how we thank you for your love and your mercy. Thank you for what Christ reveals about you. And in his sweet name we pray. Amen and amen. All hearts and minds clear. <coughs> All hearts and minds clear. And don't forget, this coming Wednesday night, we'll be returning to our Standing on Solid Ground, looking at Christian cults, uh, those that claim the name of Christ but, uh, but do not match up with what Scripture say or what Scripture says about Him and His work. Uh, we'll be picking that up again this Wednesday night. So you be much in prayer that God will just lead us in the right direction as we do that and that we'll be able to better witness to those uh, that have fallen into those traps, all right? Uh, like I said, be much in prayer tonight for the James Larkins family. Like I said, this is the fourth funeral in eight days uh, that we've been associated with one way or the other. Uh, but be much in prayer for uh, the Lark James Larkins family. Dear saint of God, served God faithfully for many, many years. Uh, but uh, he's home now and, and rejoicing, so we're, this is just our chance to honor the family and, and rejoice in what God's done, all right? So you be much in prayer for them tonight. Like I said, that receiving of friends is going on right now. We're heading over that way. But the mic uh, will be taking care of the prayer time. Uh, and like I said, he's got several that I just updated him about just right before the service tonight. So be much in prayer for all of those on our prayer list that God would just touch and have his way, all right? All hearts and minds clear. All hearts and minds clear. Then, Brother Mike, you dismiss us in a word of prayer, my friend. Amen. God bless you. I'm going to take off my microphone. They might not <laughs> let me doing that with me.